My name is Randy Mooney. I pastor Greenbrook Baptist Church in South Haven, Mississippi. I want to welcome you into my study today. And we're going to be looking at a familiar passage with most people, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. And uh, instead of reading the whole chapter, we're just going to read the portion, each portion uh, that goes with our, our message. Uh, our study today is going to be Christian fidelity. What does it mean uh, when we speak of Christian fidelity? Fidelity is not a word that we use very much anymore in the church. I believe it's a word that should be. Uh, it's been replaced with the word faithful, and we ought to be faithful. So what does it mean to be a faithful Christian? Uh, one person may go to church uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and he may say he's a faithful Christian. Uh, another person may say, well, our church only has services Sunday morning and Wednesday night. And I go to those two services, and I consider myself to be a faithful Christian. Uh, one person may say, I read my Bible daily. The other person says, well, I read my, my Bible often, but I don't uh, read it every day. So how could we say, uh, biblically speaking, that a person is a Christian is uh, faithful? Well, that's our subject uh, matter, and so we will look uh, at uh, our text uh, we'll read, first of all, uh, the first four verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The Bible says, We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he hath said, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses. Now, as we think about uh, those four verses first, uh, I see the idea of occupation. Uh, Paul is saying because of the Christian's occupation, uh, we need to be faithful. Uh, you see, if a person uh, has a job somewhere, a factory job, and and he does it to clock in at the appointed time, and, and uh, he misses just every time he des decides to, then he would certainly not be a faithful employee, nor would he keep his job long. And I'm, I think most people think, when it comes to their walk with God, that there's no work involved, that, you know, it's just, uh, everything's just happy-go-lucky, and just, I can do what I want to, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. Uh, but God's given us a job. I believe every Christian is employed by God. And he has a job. And our text speaks a little bit of the job, but it especially uh, speaks after our job description has been given to us. Paul says, we then, as workers together with him. Now, I believe Paul's indicating two things there. Certainly, we are co-workers with Paul, even though Paul's going on to be with the Lord now, we still carry on as a co-worker with him. Uh, we do what he did, and that is we carry the gospel out. But the, the chapter before, chapter 5, uh, speaks to us what our job is. It says in chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When a person is born again, when a person is saved, just all of a sudden he has a clean slate. His past sins have been forgiven him. He has a brand new start with God. And God gives him an employment. God hires him, as it were, and puts him to work. And so, uh, continue on in chapter 5, will give us that employment. It says uh, in verse 18, uh, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Every believer has a ministry. We have a work for God, and that work is reconciliation, to tell others that they can be reconciled to God. That was verse 18. If you skip down to verse 19, he says, And hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Every believer has the word of reconciliation. God has given us his, his Bible, and, and, and within that Bible we are informed how to tell people how to be reconciled with God. Uh, and then, lastly, in verse 20, 
He says, and now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. So the believer's occupation is simply to tell people about Jesus Christ and that they can be reconciled. Now back to chapter 6, we then, as workers together, Paul uses three words to indicate our occupation. In verse 1 he says that we are workers together with him. Now we've already talked about that. We are co-workers with Paul, but we are workers with Christ. We are workers of Christ uh, and with Christ. In verse 3 he tells us somewhat of a warning. Uh, he, he says, uh, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. It is when we fail to uh, witness to people and we fail to try to see people saved and we fail uh, to carry out the gospel and the word of God uh, that people look at us and say we know the church is not doing anything the church didn't help me the church doesn't do anything for me and oftentimes the church gets a bad name and he says the ministry should not be blamed therefore Christians need to be faithful carrying out the work of reconciliation and then thirdly he says in verse 4 uh, that we approve ourselves as the ministers of God. Each individual Christian must approve himself unto God. And he does so by carrying out the gospel to people and being faithful in his occupation. Every one of us work for Christ and we need to be faithful doing that. But the second thing that is given to us deals with association. Uh, we will skip down to verse 14 because uh, verse 5 uh, through 12 speaks of some of the hardship of being, an uh, of being employed of God. And we have distresses, we have stripes, we have imprisonments. All kinds of bad things happen to, to the people of God. And I believe that may be one reason that we, we're not so faithful to carry out the work of God. But as we look now to our association, he says, uh, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, uh, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath uh, he that believeth with an infidel, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols. And so as we look at those verses, it's easy to see association. He says, Be not <clears throat> unequally yoked together. I believe this has to do, in fact, the word unequally yoked together uh, has the, the, the idea, the meaning of obligation. And so in our association, we need to be careful with who we associate with and who we obligate with. Now most cases we think, when we read those verses, we think of marriage and, and merchanting. We think, you know, we shouldn't marry an unbeliever and you shouldn't uh, have a business, uh, not, not necessarily a business transaction, but you shouldn't go into business. You shouldn't be yoked up with an unbeliever, shouldn't go into business with an unbeliever, and you shouldn't be married to an unbeliever. Well, I believe both of those are true, but our verses don't end there, and the subject does not end there. So, first of all, our obligation. We need to, we need to stay uh, with our with our. Uh, yoking up or with our, our joining together in marriage it needs to be with a believer. And when we, uh, if we choose to go in business or in a partnership with another person, that, that person should be a believer. So who do we obligate with? We need to obligate to believers and with believers. But secondly, it has to do with participation. He says, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? The idea there of, of fellowship is we get our word or the word means part uh, participation. Righteousness does not participate with unrighteousness and unrighteousness does not participate uh, with righteousness. So it's, it's very, that, to me that portion of the verse is very easy to understand. You don't participate, Christians don't participate in unrighteousness just like you can't get the, the unrighteous people to come to church and participate with worshiping God. They're not going to do it and you shouldn't participate with them in doing ungodly things. And then thirdly, it says, What communion hath light with the darkness? The word com communion there uh, is uh, the idea of commonality. What, what things do they have in common? 
Uh, and certainly light and darkness, they have nothing in common. You take a room that's uh, uh, dimly lit, uh, or you take a room, first of all, that's, that's dark. If you bring light into uh, that room, that room is no longer dark. You may say, but it's, it's dimly lit. I just brought a candle in here. It doesn't light up the entire room. No, but it, it, it removes the darkness. You take a room that, that has light, that is lit, and you turn the lights off, and what do you have? You have darkness. There, there's no commonality between light and darkness. Uh, a room is either lit or it's dark. Now, it may vary how dark and it may vary how lit it is, but nevertheless, you can't have a dark room and a light room together. There's no commonality. It's one or the other, and Christians should see things as that way. It's either right or wrong. And so, how am I going to know if I'm a faithful Christian? Well, my occupation. Do I work for God? And then my association. What about these that we've already looked at? Well, there's some more, so let's look at them. What concord hath Christ with Belial? The idea there of concord is the idea of harmony. What harmony does Christ have with Belial? Now, uh, I believe to fully understand this, we need to realize the word Christ, it's capitalized, it's, it's, it's the person Jesus, but the word Christ means anointed, the anointed of God. The, the one chosen by God to save the world. Now what does that person, Jesus, the Christ, the anointed of God, what does he have in harmony with Belial? Now the word Belial means worthlessness. And it is also capitalized. And so what, so it, it, it personifies this. What harmony has Christ, you might say, has Christ with the devil, with Christ with Satan? But what fellowship, what, what the commonality, what harmony does Jesus have, does Christ have, the anointed of God have with the personification of wickedness? Christ, who has never sinned, with the embodiment of sin, there's no harmony there. And it should not be harmony with us, with unbelievers and with those that are wicked. And then it says, well, what part hath a believer with an infidel? The word part there is the idea of portion. We might even say the word inheritance. But what inheritance or what portion does a believer have with an unbeliever? A believer that is saved, his sins have been forgiven. The unbeliever's sins have not been forgiven. The believer... Uh, Jesus says uh, to, the, to the believer that he has abundant life, uh, and we know that Jesus said he came that we might have life, and that we might have it more abundantly. Uh, and also the believer goes to heaven when he dies and is in the very presence of God. The unbeliever says, I don't want God. I don't want any part of God. I wish the Christians would leave me alone, let me live the way I want to live. See, he has no inheritance. He has no part with the believer. His, his sins are still attached to him. He will go to hell when he dies. And so Paul is making it very plain to us that there's no association between the things of God and, and the things against God. And then lastly, he says, Or what agreement hath the temple of God with the temple of idols? The, the word there, the idea there of agreement is the word consent. What what consent does God give to the temple of idols? Well, none. Uh, God would never say to a believer, Oh, yes, by all means, go worship with the unbeliever today in his idolatrous practice. No. And, and by the way, neither will the temple of idols say, Oh, by all means, go down to the Christian church and learn about Jesus. No. You see, these are opposites. They are against one another. And so Paul tells us in our associations that there are either things we do and there are things that we do not do. And people say, oh, I'm, oh I know I'm saved and I'm faithful. And they run around with folks that drink and they, they have a beer with them so that they don't offend them. Folks, that's not faithfulness. Faithfulness, God says here that we, that, that it, 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 who we obligate with, who we participate with, 
people we hang around that we have commonalities with, that we have harmony with, that we have inheritance with, or that we consent with. I tell you what, it's, it's serious. Our walk with Christ is very serious. And I'm afraid we as Christians often do not take it seriously enough. And in the last portion of our chapter, is only two verses. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. You know, we think about this, come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing. He says to separate ourselves from uh, the, the, those people. You know, the, the latter part of the verse, wherefore, uh, someone has said years ago, uh, if you see the word wherefore, see what it is therefore. Uh, what Paul is saying is, since we have learned about our occupation, our working for Christ, and because we've learned about our association, who we associate with and who we are not to associate with, he says, come on out from among them and be ye separate. Christ is actually calling his people to come out from among the world and be different and be okay with being different. And so he says, come out from among them and be ye separate. This word separate is an interesting word. It, it means to cast out of society as wicked or abominable. You know, the, the unbeliever right now has a, has a problem with the Christians. Our immorality today, uh, they're, they're just daring the church to say something. And if anybody stands up against the sins of our day, uh, it seems like they just uh, flock to that person and try to make him recant his statement. And God says, just come on out from them and be different. You just go ahead and declare what God says, and, and hey, let them do what they want to do. Let them do what they want to do. It's interesting that, uh, kind of a side note here, we want the NFL to tell us what's morally right and morally wrong, but we won't let God's people who have the Word of God. You see how twisted things are? I believe it's twisted because it, that football is one of the gods in this country. And gods, by the way, dictate to their followers what is morally accepted and what is morally unaccepted. And so does Jesus. And Jesus is the only real God, the only true God. I think I'm going to see what he says about morality instead of what the NFL does. So Paul says, come on out from among them. Don't be associating with, with folks uh, that... that uh, remove Christ and bring in their points of view. We could stay right there for a long time about the NFL. They took Tim Tebow out. They didn't want him. They, they discarded him and they started bringing homosexuals in and promoting them. So do you see what I'm saying? It's very simple if we'll just think on it. Just think on it two or three minutes and I believe you'll understand. That's what's going on. So then it says, touch not the unclean thing. There are things, folks, that are dirty. There are things out there that are filthy. There are things out there that are sinful. And Paul says for the Christian to come out, separate himself from it, and don't even touch it. I mean, the, the, there, there's an Old Testament uh, uh, equation to this. There's an Old Testament verse. In fact, Paul is actually quoting an Old Testament verse in verse 17, and that's Isaiah chapter uh, 52. Now, if you'd read that, you'd find that verse there that he's quoting. But the idea of there, touch not the unclean thing, it is a physical touching. Literally, don't put your hands on it. Folks, there are things that we say, oh, I go down there with them, but I don't, I don't drink like they do. My, my best friends use drugs, but I don't do anything. He says, come out from among them. Separate yourself from those people. And my friend, we need to separate ourselves if we're going to be faithful. Thank you.